we will get started and hopefully we'll have some more people joining us. I'm going to do the official recording here. Recording in progress. Okay. Well, welcome to Changing the Game, season six, the season we're talking about from quality to from quantity to quality. Uh, say that five times real fast and see how you do. I know I, it's a tongue twister for me every time. But we know it's the, the end of the awards year is fast approaching. And whether you've already hit your goals, you're feeling like you're a little bit be or behind, this series is really designed to help give you some practical, doable steps to help you advance your business and spend more time playing your position, working with the people that really energize you and that you can have the greatest impact on. So I'm your host, Jennifer Hensley with Playmaker Coaching and Consulting. And after 20 years of working with NM Advisors, you know, we're here to make sure that we can bridge all these great ideas or uh, insights and 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 uh, action steps with small steps forward that you can take care of your business that are really gonna have a big impact. So it's opening day. Uh, I have a, a football uh, background, but I know we're, you know, this time of year, we're actually talking more about baseball and uh, the spring season of everybody I know here in Wisconsin's got the itch to, to, to have it feel like spring. Uh, we're slowly getting there. Uh, but this webinar specifically for those intimate advisors, especially the two to kind of 15 year up and coming that are trying to scale and grow and get to the next level in your business on how you can up level with marketing efforts. So this season, we have a lineup of three great speakers. We're starting the season off with Jamie Houston. Welcome, Jamie. It's great to have you with us today. Um, so I'm going to um, turn it over to you to share a little bit about your background, a little bit about your practice, who your ideal client is, and then we'll get into our discussion today. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So um, Jamie Houston, I'm in my 11th year now as an advisor, uh, all with Northwestern Mutual. I was a client for a few years before that, so I got to experience this work from the client side and grow an appreciation for it. Um, I'm based out of Cleveland, Ohio, but I spent my first seven years and started the business in Las Vegas, where I called home for 15 years total. Uh, so I have a focus now on working with women attorneys. That target market kind of developed over the years uh, and, and has been a focal point for probably the last six or so years of my business. And I work with people all around the country. I was doing Zoom before Zoom was popular. I used some other tech back in the day, <laughs> um, but I actually closed my first client virtually. So I like working with people face-to-face -face where I can, uh, but about 80% of my time I spend on Zoom, even with my local clients who no longer want to deal with traffic or germs. So well, That's great. Uh, well, it's great to have you. And I know we're going to talk a lot more about your target market, how that fits into our discussion about working with more A plus people as we go today. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes of our conversation, then we'll open up to questions. So as people join us, um, you can cab, uh, grab, I cannot talk today. You can use the chat and insert your questions there. So when we get to the Q&A, we can go through all of those. Um, or you can just unmute yourself and ask your question live. Love to do that as well when we get to that point. So Jamie, tell us a little bit more when, and we were talking about this a little bit before we went live, when you thought about this topic about how to move to better quality, um, what really came to mind to you of like, why do you feel like that's so important to you as a advisor? Yeah, so it's all about efficiency. That's really what it all boils down to, right? The the higher we can get our ratios to go in terms of turning to S's, to prospects, to clients, um, ultimately the less work we have to do, the less wheel spinning on the hamster wheel to get people on the calendar. So I think that's really the, the sweet spot. If we can get to the spot where our clientele um, understands kind of our mission and our ideal client and can more readily refer us to people in their network. It just eliminates a lot of the noise and a lot of the effort that it takes to get people on the calendar and to convert them into, into clients. So in the beginning, it's definitely a quantity game. I have to slow myself down before the word comes out to <laughs> quantity game, right? Um, for everybody, just fill in the funnel as full as you can because you don't know what's going to what's going to work and what's not going to work and who's going to be ready and who's not. Uh, but over time, I've learned to appreciate, you know, kind of finding that that good fit, uh, the right clientele that's that's an ideal fit, and then being able to replicate those to make myself more efficient. Great. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, a particular marketing effort. We were talking maybe about target markets and everything that's really helped you to focus in on working with more of those uh, women attorneys that you mentioned as your target market. 
Yeah, so it's, um, well, I grew up in the Plocker network, so I've learned for, you know, from Keith Wagner and really have an appreciation for LinkedIn. I do think LinkedIn is one of the most effective prospecting tools out there, if not the most in my business. Uh, and that's part of what led me to the women attorneys market or to really flourish in that market. Mm -hmm. So uh, I personally don't love working with doctors because they're not on LinkedIn. And I think LinkedIn just makes our lives so easy uh, by comparison to the you know, having to get the cell phones and do the text intros and that kind of thing. So it was a combination of my affinity for LinkedIn and actually a great client of mine who is in banking, but she and her bank were a sponsor of a women's attorney group in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. She invited me to come when we were doing prospecting as a routine part of our meeting. And she said, you know, I'm in this, uh, my bank sends me to this women's law group. I think they're great people. Would you like to come to that with me? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> right. I was open to any and all networking opportunities. I met her at a networking lunch that not ended up not being as fruitful itself, but got me to her, which got me to this target market. So mm -hmm. I'm great. So I went with her to the luncheon, found there was no one else in the room like me, no one calling on these women. It wasn't a huge group, uh, but was very warm, very welcoming, had a good amount of a social aspect as well as a business aspect regularly scheduled um, meetings, regular group of attendees, plus new faces every single time. And I just recognize this is a pretty, pretty good deal that I've landed upon here in terms of being able to help these women who no one else has tried to help um, with their planning and, and then just continue getting referred through LinkedIn. So that, mm -hmm. that combination of like finding a good group and then being really laser focused and effective with a LinkedIn strategy helped me cement that this was going to be my target market. Great. So you talked about both, you know, the networking or opportunities to speak to the audience as well as connect with them on LinkedIn. Can you tell us a little bit more about like three, you know, steps that you took, you know, LinkedIn for some people might feel very overwhelming of like, where do you get started? Or I know there's lots of buzz always about, you know, not wanting to sound salesy of like, you know, how do you, how do you make that work for you? Yeah, so I have spent a lot of time crafting my language over the years. I feel authenticity is one of my core values, right? So I want to feel really comfortable in my skin and in the words that are coming out of my mouth. I'm also a big student of this business. I was listening to a podcast yesterday in a thunderstorm while I drove home and I, the person was saying what works for them. And I immediately went, nope, that's not for me. That language, that's great that it works for her. That will never be my language. You know, I'm good at filtering through what I hear and saying either Yes, I'm implementing that. I'm taking and, and building on what I've done or improving on it with that nugget or no, that is not me. So I think having a, a set of language that you really feel good and genuine in makes, for me, makes the LinkedIn strategy very easy because I legitimately like every word that I'm writing in these messages and I don't have to actually do the mental work of figuring out the words I'm copy pasting them because I have all these things templated of how I reach out. Mm -hmm. uh, did that answer your question? I feel yeah, like yeah. I feel like I have so many more questions, but I'll hold on to some of those too to make sure we give time to other people and some of the other things that I, I think you can share with our audience today. So uh, you had mentioned LinkedIn and the networking group and everything. Tell us a little bit more about um, how you make sure that you're, you know, intentionally focused in on this audience. If this is your A plus, you know, trying to replicate them, what are some of those things you're doing to make sure that that's where you're spending your time? It, it's as simple as just sticking to it and saying it in plain words, right? I, I had to have the courage to put on my website that I focus on helping women attorneys with their planning. My language on LinkedIn is that I love getting to help women attorneys build their financial confidence. It's it's right out there, right? I'm not hiding it. I'm not tiptoeing around it. I am blanketing, you know, everything that I communicate with the fact that this is the people, these are the people that I help. And so that that um, took a lot of dating different networking groups, trying out different things, spinning my wheels, some wasting some time networking in places that weren't as efficient. But I'm grateful for those experiences because it helped me realize when I got to this one, this is what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. or this is where I should spend my time, spend my dollars, pay for their sponsorships, sponsor their galas. You know, the marketing dollars I put into it were easily well spent because they multiply, you know, paid for themselves with just a couple of clients turning it around. So, well, it sounds like now, I mean, you kind of, uh, you become more known in that because it sounds like you're yeah, doing sponsorships, you're in the networking groups, they're seeing you on LinkedIn, your, your message on your website speaks to them, like that it's, it's really uh, all aligned of that's mm -hmm. who you help and how you help them. Yep. Yeah. Try to be really clear and upfront about it. So there's really no question when they check me out, which they're inevitably going to LinkedIn says the same thing. It's all, it's all aligned. 
Well, I'm sure this hasn't always been easy. Like you said, some things that maybe felt like it was inefficient along that journey and probably still figuring some of it out, I'm sure too, of like, how do you continue to evolve your practice? But tell us a little bit about some of the challenges or obstacles you've had that maybe other people could uh, avoid from things you've learned along the way. Yeah, I think networking is a is a double edged sword to this topic, right? You can get a lot of quantity. You can pick up a lot of business cards going to networking events, but the quality is, in my experience, generally pretty low. There's a lot of people there who maybe have also just started a business. They're really hungry. They're also kind of broke, you know. So I've I've coached a lot of advisors over the years on, you know, if you need to fill the funnel, you just need meetings book them, right? Go out and do these networking events, grab the cards, set one-on-ones. These people should be willing to do a one-on-one with you because they came to network, right? Um, expect it to be a networking meeting. Come super well-prepared. Do your research. Make your LinkedIn or, or Facebook or Instagram or whatever list to build your network of people that you want to ask to get referred to. Um, maybe you'll get some fact finders out of those. Once in a while, you will if your language is good. And I, I coach on the language to kick those networking meetings off too. But um, very seldom do those convert to clients. Much more often do they convert to referrals. And so being focused on what the purpose of the meeting is, what the purpose of going to that networking event was, setting some measurables for yourself. You know, I need to leave with at least three business cards or something if you're terrified and it's your first one, or I'm going to go with a buddy, we're going to divide and conquer, you know, coming up with a strategy and just being really thoughtful about how you're going to spend that time. Because it is, that is a lot more of a quantity play than a quality play. And I think the quality comes, I mean, for me, it was in about my fourth year that I that I stumbled happily into this group and found a happy place, you know, found a real good alignment of values and um, thinking styles, communication styles, and all the things that just led me to recognize this is this is where I want to be um, with my clients. But I think, you know, the, the quality comes from figuring it out, spending the time with a lot of people, trying to help as many people as you can. And then perhaps in year two or three or four, December, late December, early January, spending some time looking over your clientele, segmenting as we all are taught to do, but also reflecting on like the personality traits of the people that are that are an A. And maybe they're an A for income and assets too, but like, what is it about, like you said, these people that you love spending time with them, that you're excited to see their name on your calendar, that you would, you know, you would do anything to, to make time and, and help them improve their planning. Those are really meaningful. And so that helped me also, you know, once I got a number of these attorneys in there, recognize, hey, this is, we're doing well. It's checking a lot of the boxes or all the boxes for my true ideal client. Now I'm ready to lean in with the marketing and embrace it more and be more forward about it because I'm building my confidence in that just by experience and spending the time working on the business. That's great. And, and let's talk a little bit about the language part of it too, because you said like with LinkedIn, you've tried different things and now it sounds like you're, you know, you can more easily say like, no, that's not me or that's me, or this is going to work for me or not. Mm -hmm. What are some things that, you know, that you, how did you know, like, this isn't working? I need to abandon that. Or, you know, how long to stick with something and everything when you're reaching out with people to, to know whether, Hey, maybe I just haven't given it enough time. Well, I mean, we all know there's a million reasons people won't meet with us. And so that's something that we all have to battle through. But I think um, looking at your, you know, kind of your dial to reach rate or your digital touch to reach rate and then conversion rate into sets is important, right? Spending the time on those fundamentals of the business and recognizing it. Our reach to set is very high, I think, because we are so direct with the language and again, focused on the market and confident about the value we can add for these people. So, um, you know, I wrote something that I liked back in 2013 when I started using LinkedIn for prospecting. And then like, I vividly remember at annual meeting when I got a phrase that I heard, I don't know who it was, but I heard them say, and I just went, that is, oh, I think it was actually Scott Ashline. I think it was. And I said, that is, yeah, just leaps and bounds better than these five <laughs> or six words I had in that section of my messaging done, delete mine, put his in. This is now my forever method of communicating that part. It was establish myself as a resource, not see if I can be a resource for you or see if I can be helpful or see if I can add value, establish myself as a resource. I know I'm a resource. I'm offering to be one to you. Who's going to say no to that? Who's like, no, I need no more resources in my life ever. I've got everything figured out. Mm. Not successful people. Successful people are open to resources, open to connections like that. And so establish myself as a resource 
five words, my, like some of my five favorite words in my language, they're in every single outreach to every new client that we make. Cause I just feel like it's so strong. Yeah. And that sounds super helpful. Just like that subtlety sometimes. And, and that comes into play a lot of times with marketing, right? It's like, we can say the same thing, but how you say it really does matter. And just that slight difference positions you in a different way. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, we want to give our audience something very practical as their step. And it probably already got a few things from what we talked about, but anything else that we didn't hit on, or you particularly would advise them of like, if they are just getting started with this saying, you know, I want to spend more time with a plus, but where do I start? What's one or two things that you can really do in the next couple of weeks. That would be that first step. Hmm. Yeah. So this, this is a courage play for, was for me too, in the beginning. Um, just like we have to do some kind of psyching yourself up before phoning, right? Remembering your why, remembering what you're here for and your purpose in this business. I like to eliminate or, or minimize anxiety around prospecting up with the same strategy, right? In that truthfully, we can provide more value to people who have more resources, right? People who are above the Roth limit, for example, they need more creative strategies than people who are under it. They just do, you know, they, so they need our guidance. They're more appreciative of it because they are in a spot where strategies are, are necessary. So that kind of language, right? Saying I work, I, I work well, I bring, I can bring the most value to people who are you know north of 250,000 of household income married because they need some unique strategies for tax planning. Um, that is a true statement that I'm very convicted in because my clients who are above that need me more than my clients who aren't. And so it's an others focused way of asking directly and telling your the person in front of you who you can best serve. So I, I just try to be as others focused as possible to say, this isn't about me, it's about them. And how can I get that as concisely across as, as possible? Yeah, I think, it, um, you know, it does tend to start with our mindset and our own beliefs and everything. And that comes through and people can see that sometimes as if you're, if you're apprehensive or not confident or unsure and everything, are they going to feel that way as well? So I think that's a great place to start of, you know, focusing on others and being confident that this is how you can really help them. Uh, who else are some people that you maybe you look to in the marketing space? You said you are always learning more, uh, listening to podcasts, different things. What are some resources that you think this group should plug into as they're on this journey as well? Oh, a lot. Um, I love the uh, the Brent Schutte, like wealth management company commentary, right? All of that that's come out, the, the Thursday advisor sessions um, and Ben Bashir in the 10X IPS. If people are trying to build their investment practice and their investment knowledge, uh, those two are a dynamic duo, getting those two channels uh, regularly on the calendar. I love listening to the Will Richardson podcast because it brings in people that have done this uh, 16 ways to Sunday and they're all super successful. Um, so that's that's the one I was listening to yesterday that, again, I like the speaker and I liked a lot of what she said other than this one little part. But, um, you know, there'll still be things that I can take away from that that double my conviction on something or motivate me to, you know, try something a little bit different. Um, so that's another really good one. Um, I would say those are my like quick, quick hits. I listened to Ben Newman's uh, The Burn podcast. Mm -hmm. He came out to our office in Vegas and did some coaching with us. He's a great guy. Um, so I get all his content. Those are some yeah, of the those are all, yeah, great, excellent resources. And I think, you know, we all, we hear things from, from different people in different ways, or every time we hear it, you know, what we, what might stick with us might be a little bit different as well. So having those different resources, you know, you can start to figure out, like you said before, about what really feels like it's authentic to you and who your clients are and what you enjoy and, and how you want to show up. So let's open it up. We have about uh, five more minutes or so for questions before we wrap things up today. So we'll open it up for questions. I know Austin's with us. He's going to be speaking on this webinar in a few more weeks. Uh, so uh, we won't steal all of his stuff today. But Austin, if you want to ask anything, uh, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat and we'll take that question. And if you aren't with us live and you find when you listen to this that you do have some additional questions, feel free to reach out to Jamie or myself. Um, it's Jennifer at PlaymakerCoach.com or in our NM Marketing Playmakers group. And we'll be sure to get you some answers or try to direct you to those resources to help with any challenges that you might have in the space because we don't have to go it alone by any means. Um, so let's start with, as we're waiting on something, I see there's something coming up in the chat here. One thing, Jamie, I wanted to ask you about was, I often get this question about, 
Um, what if your natural market, you know, the people that you really enjoy with most really can't, don't seem like they have the ability to refer up to more what you would want to work with us from a revenue perspective. What is your advice on, should you narrow down and try to go even more niche within that market of maybe where there is some possibility or try to add in another market, you know, that might not be as enjoyable to you, but could be more, more profitable. What are your thoughts around that question? Yeah, that's a great one. I, I think if you're finding, you know, consistently that your natural market just draws a blank when you say, for example, that 250K income number, then yeah, you probably are going to have to go outside the box and, and plant yourself somewhere. But again, my story is it took one person who wasn't even in the market to get me in this market, right? She's a banker. She found me this women's attorneys group. So all it takes is an introduction like that. I would say, you know, you never know when you're sitting with someone and networking who might be in their network, but the more prepared you can be, the more likely you're going to get referred to the people you want. So my team, when they make a list off LinkedIn, I call them intro lists because we are not horses. I don't like to feed, um, but an intro list. I like it one page. I don't like, you know, to the quality quantity debate thing. I don't like 16 pages off LinkedIn. I like one page. So it's 10 to 15 names. Um, and I do some recruiting for, you know, for the firm as well. So we might have some recruiting names on there, but it's um, target market. So again, it's women attorneys like in Cleveland, if they're in Cleveland, if they're not, my team writes where they are. And I recently actually launched into a new market. I went to Cornell and I kind of always shied away from marketing to Cornell people. It just seemed a little strange to me. And then I saw and listened to the success that Josh Johnson's having in the Harvard market. And I went, I'm a dummy. <laughs> I need to figure, I need to just follow suit. And so I found a partner, an accountability partner, another Cornell grad. Um, and we've spent about a year I guess it's almost a year and a half now, um, leaning in, right? Leaning into that new market and just recognizing, man, there's a lot of potential with these people that we we actually do have a connection to, um, but neither one of us had ever really uh, capitalized on. So I think, you know, spending some time reflecting or again, networking in a very intentional way. Like if you were to decide, yeah, I want the medical market or I want dentists or I want nurse practitioners or whatever, spending time figuring out, do you know at least one or do you know somebody who might know one and could that one open the door for you? Uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing what can happen when that first door opens. Yeah, I love that you're being very thoughtful with this because I think when you have a strategy, like you mentioned, and then you're able to implement that consistently, that that's really when your efforts start to pay off is, is not just doing it like, well, we did this for a month and then we abandoned it and then we're going to try this next thing of like, how can you make sure there's something, even if you're doing less, you know, in terms of volume, sometimes still being very intentional and, and systematic with how you're approaching it. Um, Austin wants to know what your favorite connection or client is that you've met via LinkedIn. Great question. That's a hard one because I've met the vast majority of my clients through LinkedIn. And I, I mean, I only think of their nominator, right? I don't really think of the fact that we got them off LinkedIn. I don't know that I could pick one. Like I remember my favorite client that I met networking. He's my whole team's favorite client because he's just a delightful person. His title is literally director of fun. He has a company, they do team building events for corporate mm. companies. But I remember meeting him. I just liked him at this event. I liked his personality. I liked his energy. I was, I think, speaking. So I do a fair amount of speaking and facilitating. Or actually, no, I think it was a it was a young professionals group that I was on the board. So I had organized the event. He attended the event. I just really liked him. So I went up afterward, gave him my business card and said, you just seem like a cool person that I'd enjoy spending time with. He's my favorite client. I met networking. I can tell you that one. Um, but the LinkedIn is a hard, harder one to answer because it's there's so many people that my brain isn't popping a single one out right now. I guess, <laughs> I guess you know what, though, being active on there has it pays off, too. I can say one of my one of my favorites is and one of the people that kicked off this Cornell thing. It's It's a guy that I knew from college. And I don't know if I'd ever actually approached him for planning. Maybe I did one message and never really followed up or something, but he came to me. I remember it was July of 2020. He sent me a message on LinkedIn saying, hey, I see that you're in this field. My wife and I are like looking for someone. I like you, right? Like we were friends. Um, would you be willing to take us on as clients? And that was a real like gobsmacking moment because I went, of course, you're like in my ideal target market. And it's taking you coming to me because I've been so backseat about this. I need to get in the front seat and drive. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess he would be my favorite one because he actually, he might be the only client that's ever come out of the woodwork through LinkedIn into my inbox and become a full planning and investment and insurance client. Um, I guess I can say, yeah, that he would, he would be it. 
it was the reverse of how I normally do yeah. it. You know, it paid off being on there and having a presence and having posts and content so people could see the type of work that we do uh, so that when they check you out, sometimes they do volunteer for financial planning. It's a, he's a unicorn yeah. that he did. Yeah. It, yeah. A lot of times they're kind of there watching in the background waiting for us or something. Right. But when they do take that step, that's what we all dream about is like those people that see it and it attracts them so much that they want to take that next step. I'm curious your LinkedIn's piece of it. Uh, tell us a little bit about, we didn't talk about like what your team looks like and if, if they're doing it or how many you're doing, are you using in the systems to automate the messages now that you know what you want to send or are you guys doing it yourself? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So I have two full-time people that, um, that support my business. Um, so Ashley does all the marketing, all the phoning, all the insurance. Um, and then Alisa does all the investments, all the planning. And so those are their main duties. Um, we don't use the automated content calendars, but for somebody who's new in the business, who doesn't have a full-time, let alone two full-time people, absolutely push that button, that easy button and get something going versus nothing. Um, Ashley selects from the content. I've given her a lot of, you know, guidance in this space of here's the types of things I'd like to see. Here's how often I want it to be like product related versus concept related. You know, I want I want you to pick the ones that focus on women and diverse people and LGBTQ community because that I serve as well. Um, and I want you to rewrite the copy in my voice, you know, like more and more in our voice than the off the shelf stuff. I think that's the the 2.0 level, in my opinion, of the of the social media like marketing. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how we do it. She posts at least three times a week, I would say. Um, we just got Instagram, so we're trying to figure that out. It's a whole different animal. I mean, I had a personal one, but now the business one. Yeah. Um, so she posts to LinkedIn and, and Facebook and has for a long, long time. And now we're adding Instagram to that. Okay. And yeah. Well, and I know Anthony, when we talk in a couple of weeks, Anthony Williams is big on Instagram. So we'll be talking more about that because I know a lot of people are probably interested in that space as well. And with yeah. the LinkedIn, like with the DMs that you're sending to people on LinkedIn, that's something that then Ashley's handling for you as well versus you know, having that being automated. You guys, and do you try to send a certain number like a week or how do you approach those to continue to reach out to potentially new people on LinkedIn? So that comes back to a quality versus quantity thing too. Um, there, we don't have a, we don't have a goal at this point in the business. We have a QS number goal, but we don't have like a weekly or daily. Well, the daily is 30. You know, I want her to make 30 touches a day. Um, she does all of it in my, you know, from my profile, she sends the first message she does. So again, we work with mostly attorneys. They actually do answer their telephones in their offices. I'm a fan of, again, efficient processes. <laughs> so she does a LinkedIn message, usually a phone call. If she still hasn't reached them, she'll leave a voicemail. Then she'll do a direct email to their firm email address, which is on their website because mm -hmm. lawyers all pretty much have websites. And then she might come back to either LinkedIn or make a few more phone calls, you know, try to reach them that way. Um, so she has that, again, all templated. The first message is under the character limit within the connection request mm -hmm. space. We do pay for the next level up of LinkedIn, whatever it is, so we can do in-mails and things too. Um, but yeah, that's all. It's all templated. The, if they accept, there's a there's a one a template for that. What's the next message? If they don't accept, there's a template. If okay. she wants to do a second one, so you guys have that. decided to take it on yourself, but have it very well structured so that it's not taking exorbitant amounts of time to to recreate it every time. And like you know exactly what you're doing at this come in. And then yeah. the last question I think we have for you with our time today was you talked about working with attorneys and one of the common question uh, challenges with attorneys seems to be usually is that they, everybody wants to work with attorneys and have them as their COIs. So, you know, getting them to refer back to you, you know, how have you found that when you're working with attorneys of getting them to refer you to other attorneys or, mm -hmm. you know, other ideal clients, what's the secret sauce there? Because that's one of the biggest things that everybody tends to complain about is the attorneys to have everybody going to them and never reciprocal. What's been your experience? I would say that's that's especially true with estate planning attorneys um, because they have a lot of financial advisors feeding them referrals, so they really can't give any out. So I kind of know that I have my bench of estate planners, but I don't look for any more. I don't want a whole bunch of those. The this the way I have success with it, honestly, though, as opposed to getting referred to their clients, is referred to their friends who are attorneys, their law school classmates, their referral partners, where they give business if it's not in their area of expertise. Um, they're very happy to refer me to people from law school and again, other firms that they've worked at. Uh, that is, that's easy to me, whereas getting them to refer me to their clients is rare, very rare. Uh, so I just kind of focus on what 
again, what they respond well to or have responded well to over the years. And I think, again, defining as much as you can something unique about you. I, I just, by being female, I'm unique in this role. So I've, I, I've focused on that, right? If there's something that makes you unique that you could relate to this market, um, like I sail right out on Lake Erie. Maybe if you're a sailor, then you could, you know, talk about work, like to work with people who are attorneys who have sailing as a hobby. I don't know, maybe that's too specific, but you could go market at a yacht club. You know, there's things you could do mm -hmm. um, if there's something that makes you unique, that makes you more referable if you're getting into a, a like-minded circle of people. Yeah, I like that. I was a big fan of like, own what's your story and what makes you unique and what you enjoy and uh, what what is different is better than being better. So how can you be that brownie in a sea of chocolate chip cookies uh, or a, a table of chocolate chip cookies, maybe I should say. So as we wrap things up today, like we said, if you didn't get your question answered, you're listening to this replay after the fact, feel free to give us uh, your feedback, your questions in the NM Marketing Playmaker group. We'd love to hear what else you wanna hear, what additional resources or questions you have about this. Uh, continue to, to share our knowledge and uh, join us again in a couple weeks. That we're actually, it'll be on Wednesday instead of Thursday, Wednesday, April 19th with Anthony Williams. And he's going to be talking a lot about customization and personalization, but how you can do that and keep it simple. And like we said, talking a little bit about how he's using Instagram as well. And then Austin Weezy will be back with us in about a month uh, to wrap up the series. So for joining us today, Jamie, we always want to uh, show our support to the advisors that are guests and sharing their knowledge and expertise. So we'd love to be able to give to a charity that uh, you're passionate about. Who can we uh, help support today? That was a great question. Um, the one I'm supporting most right now is the Women in Law section of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. I'm sure they would appreciate a donation in, um, in my honor. Wonderful. Well, we're great to be glad to be able to support them. We'll follow up with you on details of that. And thank you again for being on here this week. Remember, Jamie's try it at home uh, or try it at work or at home tip and everything about, you know, having that courage to really focus on others and how you can show up for them and lead with that. And what a difference that might make just to even get things started and moving up with working more of the people that you really want to uh, impact and help to take it to their next level in their own personal lives and financial lives. So one final thought for you guys today as we wrap things up is, you know, now is the time to create that focus plan. Jamie talked about that a lot today about being intentional. Now's the time to ask for what you want. She leaned into it. She put it everywhere that this is who she works for. You can do that too. Now is the time to do more of what you love. And now is the time. So don't wait, get started, and we'll be back in a couple weeks and looking forward to connecting with all of you and, and hearing all the great things that you guys achieved this award year. So have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jen.